to episode 46 of the BTF podcast. That is the Back to Football podcast, the number one podcast for people who probably should talk about something other than football. Today is the 6th of June 2020 and uh, we've got a full house today, which I'm delighted uh, to have. Uh, Joining me is Johnny Mills. How are you, John? Uh, Very well, thank you very much. Uh, How are you, uh, Levi? I'm very good, thank you. Um, missed last week, but I'm back and better than ever. Greg? I'm good, thanks, man. Yeah, good to have you back. And Dan? And and yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm all well. Um, I do like obviously broadcasting live on a on a Saturday as we have been um, for the last few weeks. It does it does feel like the natural place for um, a football. Uh, podcast to exist and obviously uh, in two weeks time we'll be looking at uh, some Premier League games to get stuck into Um, so we will be going back to football at the end of the show today Um, but first up we've got a a more important topic I think to talk about Um, this is territory I guess that that we've not really ventured into on on this show before Um, it's something um, new for us to be discussing kind of in a, in a public forum. Um, and I'd, I guess I'd first like to say that, um, you know, that personally there's a, uh, a sense of, of, of nervousness around this topic, but I, I don't think necessarily that's a bad thing. And I think that's something that we um, need to embrace. So obviously the topic that I'm talking about is uh, Black Lives Matters and the protests um, that have come following the, tragic death of George Floyd in uh, Minneapolis, uh, in Minnesota, in the USA. Um, This is a tough subject. Um, Boys, obviously, be as open as you feel comfortable with. Um, And I think I'd like to think there's there's no right or 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 wrong things to say here. Um, I guess we could talk about this week. We had the Blackout Tuesday, um, I don't know what we call it, a movement or a, a social media um, campaign. Campaign, Okay, campaign. Oh. Um, I'd probably like to start on that and I guess could maybe go around the room here and, and did people take part? I, I, I'll start. I posted on my social media the, um, the black image, the uh, black square. Um, and yeah, I mean, uh, Greg and, and John, did you, did yeah. you take part in Blackout Tuesday? Yeah. Yeah. Um, if, if nothing more, I think that it, um, it, it showed that you follow the, the right kind of people in that there's a, there's a support, you know, it's, I think that there's a lot of different discussion about if it's, you know, um, what level it's, it's doing for the campaign and the Black Lives Matter. But I think that at real base level, it shows that people are taking notice around the world and people are, you know, if they might have lived their lives normally and not had to face issues such as this. But now because such a tragedy has happened, people are logging on social media and, and have them being faced with that and coming to terms with that and realizing what is going on. And I think that that is a important, of course, important discussion. <clears throat> to have. Yeah. There's that element, which is nice to say, I don't know, John, did you want to say something there? Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. Although I um, I'm not against anyone that didn't do it for any particular reason. Um, I agree with you. It just kind of shows the power of social media and the fact that a lot of people were, um, saw it fit to show that they sort of um are aware of what's going on and recognize that there that there is an issue so they're going to they they use that opportunity to get involved um i was i really did like the the sort of posts that sort of preceded that which was things around about um okay you've done that it's not just about social media what's the next steps what's the next actions um you know within you as an individual or, or um, you know, locally and nationally. Um, so a lot of uh, um, posts like that, I was sort of liking um, and, and, and commenting on because that's kind of the bigger issue. Yeah. Um, Levi, before uh, we come to you on on the on the on the Blackout Tuesday um, thing, um, John, I know your your post um, on that day, and and 
I think it's important, I think, for to not separate maybe Blackout Tuesday and um and Black Lives Matter. I think I think Blackout Tuesday was maybe a day that inspired people to post, but it wasn't necessarily just around not posting anything on social media that day. I think it was more of a maybe an opportunity for for um for some people to post i know we've uh we've spoken about it personally uh or candidly be- between me and you about um about your your post on that day and um i don't know if you're if you're okay with with talking about that um briefly um i i was i was moved um by your post i found i found you know this week was um quite an emotional uh week in terms of kind of feelings of of grief anger sadness maybe some shame um from a from a community point of view um mixed with you know there's elements of hope in there as well um and yeah your your post um kind of just hit you know all of those emotions at once um i don't know whether you want to are you okay to go back over maybe um, some of the points you made in that post and some of the experiences that, that you kind of shared with us, maybe around the, the police brutality side of things? Uh, yeah, no problems. Um, I, it took me a while to, to actually post anything. I, I kind of, when the whole thing came out, I was just kind of like, oh, not again, um, sort of thing. And I went through a few days or, or, or a day or two of, just feeling deflated just feeling like i'm not going to post anything i'm not going to look at anything i'm not going to watch anything because nothing's going to change um you know you have the marches and i kind of thought about all the stuff that you, that's obviously um, readily available to see on social media of, of stuff that's happened in the past um you know injustices things like you know to, back to football <laughs> you know podcast where you're talking about football there's not there's a lack of representation in in the premier league and i started thinking about all these things and i just thought ah you know what i'm not going to say anything um but then i just kind of started seeing um the sort of uh, you're and you're right the, the 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 blackout tuesday sort of social media campaign plus other people's posts plus the negative stuff that were what people were saying um, like all lives matter and, um, or uh, you kind of saying, oh, what about this person or about that person kind of urged me to say, well, I, w- I want to kind of share my, um, my experience or share or show people that the impact that that has individually on individuals um, and the impact that racism has on, on had on me and you know because obviously you you guys see me and other people see me you know and, and as well as me and 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 other um sort of um BAME people or, or even specifically black people we're walking around we're in your you know day-to-day life where we're, we're smiling we're having fun we're, we're part of it all but there's the other side which isn't seen which is things that we've been through things that we've experienced experienced which you which you haven't which are wrong it's as simple mm-hmm. as that so that's kind of the the sort of thing that urged me to to do that and i just kind of wanted to, sh- to show that you know me and you know <laughs> not, not middle-aged but not there yet but you know <laughs> I, I you know I, you know I'm a, I'm a black man born in this country but i'm a black man that grew up without his dad from his, the age of like nine onwards because of racism um mm-hmm. and and subsequently my children have a grandfather who they've never met now that's not to say something couldn't have happened within that time but that's you know in my head that there's there's a there was a link in my life and between racism and that current situation that i'm now in and and why the picture looks how it looks um so i kind of wanted to kind of get that across um to to people and show that it is a big thing racism is a big thing um it's made made a huge impact on my life not only for what my father went through but also what i went through with the stops and search and uh, you know and uh, and um this, not just a stop and search to protect the neighborhood or or a, a fit in a description but the random ones where there's no description being fit it's just kind of you know just random and there's nothing there was no basis to it like the fact that having not having a decent looking car um is is a crime if 
if your skin color doesn't fit the bill. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just kind of wanted to share that and say, these things are happening, whether you're in an area where you don't see it or whether you've never experienced it. I just wanted to show that these things are happening. And that's kind of the reason for my, for my post. Yeah. Mm. I guess um, it's difficult in this situation as well, because it's not, the it's not an obligation or your obligation to spread the mess like to spread the message here like that that's something that is very difficult and 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 this this podcast and this discussion very much should not be a case of 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 me and greg as 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 white males sitting here saying levi and john can you can you please educate us on on what you know, on, on racism. And, and I think that's something that's maybe stood out for me this week and, and, and being um, difficult to, to deal with is, is the fact that suddenly you've got all these um, people and companies and institutions suddenly going, yeah, like we do, we've just been reminded that actually racism exists. And, and, and I don't know whether like you must be sitting there thinking, yeah, you, you really think so? Like you you're really just realizing that or just acknowledging that. And um and I think you know it, it's not it's not necessarily the your duty to now educate everyone. I think uh, there has to be some sort of like personal ownership of your own education and your own um actions. Yeah. Um, well for me personally, I think this week has given me personally a lot to reflect on, especially particularly the post, John. I, I come from an area where, you know, it's, it's very, um, you know, uh, I don't really know what the word is, I suppose. We, we voted for UKIP, you know, we voted their seat in, you know, that's all I need to say about the area that I come from. And um, so this week, it gave me a lot of things to think about. And, you know, naively, I think, I thought, you know, you look over at America and you think, God, it's really bad over there. Like, they've got a real problem. And of course, but I wouldn't, understand the issues because I've not been you know it's that thing of white privilege of course it exists you know and like John you were saying about the random stop and searches and things and I've got no concept of how that could possibly how I can't fathom that but of course I can't so it's it's given me a chance to reflect and think beyond myself really and think you know it is important as you say Dan that you know the the onus is on all of us to realize what is actually happening here and it it shouldn't take a tragedy like this for us all to realize that and you know it is the next step is is as important as what's going on now you know this is woken up a lot of conversation bless you it has broken up a massive conversation but that conversation has to keep happening and it has to you know we have to you know we don't need to be constantly reminded of it be constantly aware of it and and know and think and fix you know these things yeah yeah absolutely. No, I agree. levi um yeah i realize that I'll say <laughs> <no>. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't come to you uh, uh um as much yet in this in this conversation um uh, i guess yeah, yeah. S- some thoughts on on firstly maybe blackout tuesday and then the, the wide wider context of maybe the, the last week or the last 10 days no yeah uh, i personally didn't choose i chose not to participate in uh, uh blackout tuesday not because i didn't think it was impactful um and an important moment i guess for um the movement of fight that we are uh currently experiencing but i think that in the age of social media things do have a tendency to to lose impact and lose um, lose meaning because there's a lot of people that might have just done it to jump on a bandwagon, um, mm-hmm. just to be seen to know they're supporting something or to be seen that they're conforming with what everyone else is doing or thinking at the time. So for me, I was going to show my support in um, talking about my own lived experiences, talking about um, what what people should should be doing because. I think in this uh, interim period of the, of the last 10 days or the last 12 days, it's also been a chance to reflect for me um, into how unfortunately normalised, um, I guess, feeling, feeling um, 
not 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 oppressed. I guess that's the wrong word. Or fe- feeling like you're you're the target, or feeling like feeling second you, class. Yeah, you have to conform to the way other people um, think, act, um, in order to be even thought to be uh, accepted. Um, and I think how normalised it has been uh, has almost like awoken something in me that's been like, uh, why is that normalised? Why do I have to act like that? Um, the instances where you're stopped by the police and I felt the need to um, highlight how educated I am, for example, mm. um, to ensure that they carry themselves in the right way to know that I am smart enough to also to know exactly what they should and shouldn't be doing. Um, and that is a scary thought because I don't think potentially an example of white privilege is not probably having to give a second thought to those sorts of things when you are stopped by um, the police. But that is the type of things that go through my head. And I think realising after the last 10 to 12 days that that isn't normal has been a bit of a wake up call for me um, as well. And I think that's what it is in the UK. We've also almost been told that, oh, yes, yeah, the worst in America, it's the worst in America. But in actual fact, in the UK, it's... Um, it's almost so there's so, almost so many microaggressions and all that, and so many oh subtle subtle hints of gas gaslighting almost um racism that yeah it's like become, passive uh, yeah it's become normalized um and i think that is what the problem is in the uk um it's almost like backhanders that you don't necessarily realize but they come with with meaning and that's been i think just the most hurtful thing for me uh in this whole period of time that i've been almost conditioned to the point where I think that these instances of um, microaggressions or passive racism or racism just point blank um, has been become normalised in my head and yeah I'm one of those people that don't just rush into things putting out a statement or um, saying X, Y, Z it has to come from a process of thought um, and actually meaning it and that's probably why I did yeah take, take a step back from um, the the black the black the blackout screen because for me for my personal that wasn't how I wanted to show my impact um, my impact will come from my words my experiences um, and yeah if <clears throat> I know you said that yeah it's not my responsibility um, to educate um, but if I can inspire those around me or uh, everyone else to to want to act to want to educate themselves to want to challenge their family members because this is not something that's going to be solved overnight and I think Mm -hmm. that that needs to be known Um, it's not something that's going to be solved overnight there's years and years hundreds of years worth of oppression racism um, countless that can't be undone I guess in five years Uh, it's going to have to take a generation of educating and overturning stigma and and overturning uh, ignorance and bigotry uh, to allow people to properly uh fathom that um there's not there's no differences in i guess distinguishing people or making them different uh on the basis of race um because i shouldn't have to i guess in 2020 john shouldn't have to in 2020 have to have an engagement with a police officer and feel the need to uh expose the fact that oh no i've studied criminology at university and i've I've got a, a master's degree to even feel um, that I'm on the same level as the police officer or the police officer will treat me better. I just should be treated as uh, anyone else would um, in the case of any interaction that they'd be having with anyone else, regardless of race and colour. I think um, I think that's one of the main reasons why this whole week has been, um, has been as big as it is, because I think, yeah, the social media as well, but I think it's because it was the police um i think that's had a, a huge impact because obviously obviously the police's job is meant to protect and serve and, and stuff like that and i think the fact that it happened at the hands of the police and the fact that my experience or or, or my father was you know beaten up by police and you know systematically regularly and then decided now nah, i'm going to back to my country of birth jamaica where this is not going to happen um is is really really like disappointing and and makes people angry because you know you think of the police as people that are trying to help 
people if there's a situation where they need help they can call the police and they can come and 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 help sort out the situation um arrest people that need to be arrested um but i feel that black people in this country and in america and across the world where this is happening feel that that's not that's not their um perception of the police it doesn't work like that for them and it definitely didn't work that way for me um and i'm sure levi will sort of echo those sentiments as well yeah no a hundred percent and uh, i just think i don't i don't I, I i can't even understand the reasons for um there's no justification for experiencing racism at all um and i just think certain behaviors in in the uk is used as a subconscious weapon almost to i think push black people down and make and do and make them feel like second class um citizens i think probably john can go on and on about this the experiences that he's had whether it's uh, passive racism or racism in all of, all contexts um of of it um he probably go on and on about instances of it and he probably could go on and on about instances that he wouldn't have thought about had this movement not come about when it um has and that's genuinely been the case for myself um just looking back on where looking back on my life and just really like understanding um instances of racism where it is going to a, a, fo a football game uh, from really early on really when i was about 14 um with my friends at crystal watch going to watch crystal palace and uh away fans on the back of the bus gesturing um, doing monkey gestures and stuff like that it is always it's almost childlike because I remember when being 14, 15 and just, and just laughing because I just don't understand. I couldn't fathom how uh, ignorance and stupidity almost was justified in that moment to do those sorts of things. But it's just, there's just so many instances that can be um, highlighted that, yeah, I think people in the UK have just gotten used to it just because the police here don't carry guns or mm. um, don't walk around with like, with guns and they would like rather taser people doesn't mean that these instances of racism are not just as bad in the UK. It's just give if you gave the police guns in the UK, we'd have exactly the same outcomes because um, black people uh, historically and there is the reality are treated with a lot more suspicion than um, white people. And unfortunately, that's just the way it is because um, people that look like myself and John, they'll put a gun out on us probably ten times as fast as white people, and it's just. Um, it's just understanding that and trying to wrap your head around that first mm. um, because now if you're stopped by the, the police you have to you, myself and John might have to think how do I conduct myself to make sure that I am completely safe when I do go back to my family or that I'm not I don't come to any harm or I don't get arrested wrongfully how do I conduct myself it's having to talk a different way um, to comport yourself in a different way and not have the same mannerisms as you potentially normally would to be you have to like remove like your sense of self and not be yourself. Um, yeah. Otherwise, you'll be you'll be targeted and you'll be seen as suspicious. You'll be seen as an aggressor. Um, and I think that that is a perfect example of systematic racism because you are having to be someone that you're not um, just to be able to be accepted by the system or to even fit in with those around you in society. And that is wrong. And I don't think I've been more proud to be, I guess, uh, a black man probably at this moment in time because I don't probably not. I'd say it's probably ignited a bit of a fire in me that I'm not going to try and just conform. Um, and quite frankly, sometimes I, if I do have an interaction with the police, I'm going to be I'm gonna be honest. Like when I had that interaction and I said that I studied a criminology degree and a master's degree, actually, this is the most shocking thing. The police officer turned around to me and used the phrase about uh, black on black crime and saying it's usually it is um black lads he used um that are killing other black lads and i just um turned around to him and i said uh and i just i turned around to him because I, I didn't know what to say because i was like why has he just turned around and said that to me and i think in that moment he felt probably he felt intimidated not because i was black or or because of how i carried myself I think he was intimidated by the fact that I was educated um, enough and he couldn't accept that. So he had to come out with something that was um, topical for him or controversial mm -hmm. so that he can seemingly in his own head spark some sort of um, intelligent conversation. 
and I didn't even want to engage in the conversation um, that he had. And I said, okay, if you're going to identify uh, a group by race, and I said, um, how do you use a phrase like that and then expect not to alien, alienate um, people who live, in, who live in the society in the UK? And he, all he could say is that is a good question because he couldn't answer it. And he would wonder why um, a lot of black people in the UK feel alienated, feel different. It's because of phrases like black on black crime that shouldn't exist because white on white crime happens and it is a thing. So, yeah, and you never, you would never hear that phrase used. White yeah. on white crime, like no, I've, no one's ever said white on white <laughs> crime. Yeah, um, and yeah, yeah. You're, com- you're completely right. Yeah, or even um, Asian and Asian crime. I mean, I went to school with an Asian um, who had cousins and friends and family who were like tr- in triads, and they were always, you know, meeting up and fighting or mm. you know attacking each other. I never heard anyone say Asian on Asian crime. Or, no. or anything like that it's just not a phrase I've ever I've ever heard but just kind of just going back on something that you said Levi because it did bring back a memory to me that I did exactly the same thing I remember being stopped on uh, Roehampton Lane in my car like this was um, many years ago and I remember thinking right and I just kind of started putting on this more English accent and being like good afternoon officer how are you <laughs> have you had a busy day like and you know <laughs> and I started, and yeah, <laughs> yeah you know tip my cap to him and everything and I did that just because of how what had happened before when I was more like this is racist this is this and and it just kind of you know ended up being worse and kind of the similar things to to um to what Levi said he was like where are you going you know and I kind of made it up and was like yeah I'm off to off, off to university um you know and and kind of had to put on this sort of persona that I was um a young sort of which I was anyway young educated black man but I had to almost kind of show that to him so that he wasn't like trying to take things further which had happened in the past like search your car unnecessarily you know you know make you two hours late for work you know because of paperwork and everything else so I had to kind of almost like you say like put on a persona put on a voice act to you know super super nice just to kind of try and diffuse the situation and that's probably something that you know white people in this country have never had to experience Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely um i'd like to quickly touch upon um the and this is again something that john you and i spoke about briefly yesterday um and obviously you and you and levi both have in common that you've been uh voted into sabbatical officer positions at, at student unions different different universities we won't go into to naming either but um John, you spoke to me about the the some of the pressures that you felt were, were put upon you um, by being in 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 that um, maybe that leadership role and and the expectations maybe that were there put upon you, um, which wouldn't necessarily be attributed to a to a, a white person maybe in that in that presidential role as well. Um, can can we? Talk a little bit about that. Maybe just explain. I probably butchered it a bit there. Um, yeah, no, in my no, explanation. You've done, <laughs> no, you've done a decent job there. Um, no, uh, yeah, kind of what I was saying to you was, it, you just kind of, I felt as if I wasn't just a president. I was the black president. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and people before me that were white presidents, they were just the president. Um, mm-hmm. So I felt that from on the side of the institution, there was more pressure for me to attend um, meetings around equality and diversity, um, kind of be that black representation on that to say, yeah, you know, we, we've spoken to a black person. So what we're doing is right. It kind of that gives them that justification that what they're doing is right, even though they don't really value what you're really saying. Um, and it was always everything to do with um, BAME or anything like that. You was their spokesperson you was their person to 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 kind of you know have an impact on that speak on that be available for that for them tokenistic what did you say tokenistic yeah that's the word i was looking for yes you i felt like there was a pressure for me to be that tokenistic guy but also and also for them as well to be that person to say oh you know some of our BAME students not getting involved getting involved and kind of put a lot of pressure from you to make that happen um but i also spoke about the pressure from the BAME side that they felt okay this isn't our home we've come to university to get a degree we want to engage we want to get involved but everything around this university is geared 
um, for, for not for us. Um, from the, the events, from the artists they have at the events, from um, the activities, um, things like um, the socials um, and, and the, the sort of drinking games and, and the kind of the, the and, and the sort of the jokes and things like that. That the environment it wasn't wasn't isn't really geared for um, you know for black students. So I, then there was the pressure from the black students, like okay, you're now our sort of leader. Uh, so, but you're going to come in and save the day. Or can you make these changes instantly, you know, and and um, uh, and try and sort of, you know, bridge the gap and and sort of do things for them. And you know, sometimes you weren't able to do that because, especially working in the students' union, and Levi will testament to that. They've got their own sort of agenda, targets, um, strategic plan, and it might not be cost effective to do an event you know, say a, a BAME night when that would replace a normal night, which would then, um, you know, maybe lose money or wouldn't give the financial sort of um, uh, projections that it would have if it was just a normal night um, where majority of the white students would be there. Um, so they would just wouldn't, wasn't willing to take that risk. So what, what I did as a sort of thing to try and do that is I kind of focused on the events. I kind of gone, okay, we're not going to get ABBA tribute band. We're not going to do that. We're going to, we're going to try and show that, you know, there is a growing urban um, sort of situation going on in the music industry. And we want to showcase that. So I ended up getting people like Lethal B, Rizzle Kicks, um, and people like that to come and play at the the summer ball and the, and the, in Freshers Week. Um, just so that people yeah. people show, show people that it wasn't just for black people because when I looked out in the in the crowd you know from from doing those events it was the numbers of the demographic was still just, it was still majority of the white people that were there so they were enjoying enjoying those events just as much as the the non-whites were so it kind of did show the students union that that they were wrong in terms of oh if we're going to urbanize or or it, to use a phrase that they would use at some of the events that it would kind of have a negative impact financially and that just wasn't the case yeah i think uh before levi we ju jump over to you maybe on this on this topic even uh, urbanize and uh, urban is quite uh that's that's one of those things that maybe two weeks ago um <clears throat> that's that's just an accepted phrase but actually when you think about it it's got there's there's quite a you know negative com connotations to ur urbanize you know you think of <clears throat> like urban areas i mean some people will think of urban as um canary wharf and and big high-rise buildings like that but the 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 main connotations of the word urban is estates and um you know areas of high population population density and you know not, maybe not necessarily the the nicest places to be living and and that's a phrase that's directly, you know, commonly associated with the BAME community or the, the black community in, in, in uh, especially in, in music. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, that, I think these are the sorts of um, important things to, to, to start to, to realize that actually like there's, there's a, so, there is so much stuff that we just accept um, as as okay or as as the language that is okay to associate with these things and actually there's there's very kind of clear um underlying sort of negative connotations to a lot of the language um levi do you have any thoughts on the on the um being sort of in a in a, a sab role i guess and um yeah no um <clears throat> I, I completely obviously like understand as well where exactly what john has said and i can definitely resonate with a lot of the things that he said it's not necessarily just uh, talking about in a university setting or just in a it's in a representative um role just in general um but yeah i i, I share most of the experiences that john does as well but i think what probably john didn't touch on as well as is as much as i i wanted to be for example the the, the representative for a specific co cohort or education was my um represent re, rep, my role essentially um but with the added pressure to represent and be the, the, the black representative, um, I felt a lot of pressure as well for the in, in terms of the black community as well because I wanted to I wanted to represent them because 
in actual fact, I was their only voice. So if I didn't do that, then um, I felt like I, was, I was failing. I was failing the black people that I was represent, representing. So I needed to. Um, I need. I felt like although I was getting the pressure and um, being put on things like on certain boards or in certain meetings um, because potentially I was a black representative, I felt like I had to uh, attend those meetings. I had to get involved. I had to be that voice because otherwise there'd be no voices uh, potentially to be heard. So I had to almost assume that ro that role as the black representative because otherwise um, I could potentially be doing more harm than good, although my role isn't to be the black representative. My role is to be the education representative as opposed to um, anything. And that isn't, and I think it's not always done intentionally, but in some cases it is, in some cases it's not. But I think, again, there is, there comes a time and people do have a habit of sleepwalking into these things um, because it's the easy fix, it's the, the easy route. Um, and I think that needs to be realised as well, um, that it's not always about looking at the easy route. It's actually looking to educate mm -hmm. yourself that, to some extent that you can come to some of the logical uh, conclusions without the help of a, a, a black representative. But if you do need the help of a, a black student, a, a black person, then it's not just aiming at the one that's in a figurehead position. It is really trying to capture the feeling of um, the many and not just um, the one representative that you have in a representative role because nine times out of 10, they will not reflect the whole black community. And that's something that needs to be realised and realised very quickly. No, uh, uh, yeah, I agree. Um, I think um, this is this is this is a topic that you know we we could do an hour every every week from here on out. Um, and and you know, I I certainly um, you know I, I really appreciate that we can have this conversation on, on the podcast um, and, you know, <clears throat> might be coming from, from my position of, of white privilege to even be able to say this, but I, I you know, I am proud of both of you um, this week in particular, how you've handled yourselves um, and, you know, what you have put out online. And um, yeah, I think, you know, hopefully this is a, a, the beginning of you know a, a turning point and and something where we we can start to see kind of meaningful change implemented in, across society and like you say people beginning to educate themselves as well as look to uh, be educated um by you know those those that can um so i think on that note we'll uh we'll jump back to football um in in one of the stranger kind of gear changes that we've ever had on this podcast um levi is there yeah no your, can i just ask yeah. that we drop yeah. um some of the links in the description yes um, to mm. support some of the uh initiatives that we've got on that camp and campaigns in america whether it's gofundme mm -hmm. um, whether it's petitions let's just drop as many as uh, as possible underneath there so that the listeners and um viewers that we do get um do check out the links in the description sign the petitions and really let's like try and support in um what is happening around the world and if we want to put it in the context of the uk um also following the campaign to get justice for uh belly majinga as well absolutely um yeah we'll, we'll put, put all those in the uh in the description below um, also also um yep. if there's space big a very big description um things <laughs> like films and stuff as well i mean the yes. other day i watched um 13th um on netflix and i would highly recommend kind of gives you a little bit of history and um kind of explains the systematic um nature of um sort of white privilege white power and and the way how uh black um people have been treated over the over the years and um sort of highlights the sort of similarities to how things were a long time ago and how similar they are today um so I, I would definitely um give that a recommend and um i think if we can if we can um mm -hmm. obviously because reading reading is not everyone's thing there's there's numerous books as well um which i think we can highlight as well in the description um that we could sort of uh, show to educate people um and obviously as well as the sort of uh, uh, support financial support um but yeah if if, if reader's not your thing there's um there's a lot of good films out there 
um, to, that you can use to educate yourself and to try and understand why um, we are where we are. Absolutely, yeah. We will drop those um, in as well, yeah, in the description below. Um, so let's talk about uh, the Premier League coming back. Um, two weeks' time, as we mentioned, there's going to be uh, games going on. Um, we've got four games on BBC for the rest of the season, four games on Amazon, and the rest will be split between Sky and BT. Um, I think... There's not too much to talk about there in terms of, of, of what will be going on. What we do want to talk about very, very briefly here um, is the situation at Chelsea and Levi. Um, you, you've uh, you've uh, got an opinion on the Timo Werner situation. I hope, I hope that deal falls through. I hope it falls through. <laughs> because I say that because um, I do slightly worry that um, Chelsea will start building a quite a strong team with um, Hakim Ziyech coming in as well. Mm -hmm. um, and Timo Werner, I start worrying that they'll actually be able to start contesting for like the top two positions because mm -hmm. right now, even with their current squad, even with they did get Werner, they're still a, a third, fourth place team, could maybe scrape second one season. They're not a, a title winning team yet because you have to be like Liverpool to be a title winning team. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, uh, I would have loved Werner, um, not necessarily to replace someone and I don't really think you can call Werner a rotation player, but I would just love to have had him in a team and because of the amount of interest that was expressed with Liverpool, um, it would just be amazing to have like the likes of Werner because in actual fact, how much longer do we see the front three of Liverpool staying intact? How do we um, refresh almost an update? I've heard rumour after rumour. I've got Isman Dembele rumours, but how do we, you know, how do we keep that going? I think Werner would have been a brilliant addition and um, but the fact that he wanted to play for Liverpool was was brilliant. And to go to Chelsea, well, you know, for him it's a downgrade really, isn't it? <laughs> I think uh, the other name um, associated with Chelsea at the moment is Ben Ch Ben Chilwell as well from Leicester. Um, apparently Leicester wants 60 million for him. I even heard this morning that Man United are, are throwing in another 80 million pound bid uh, like they did for Harry Maguire, uh, Leicester's way. But... Um, if we talk sort of beyond beyond the players at Chelsea and we're looking at potential and potential to win and, and stuff, if you're looking at manager potential, is there a manager at this point that that has m more potential than maybe Frank Lampard does to, to become a Premier League winner? Mourinho. <laughs> Bring that Tottenham. So, yeah. so just talking about so potential as in yeah, yeah. people that have, yeah. Chris Wilder is doing all right. Yeah. <laughs> if he went to a different team, maybe. Yeah. Do, you, do you, John? Do you think Lampard would have what it takes to to manage a, a Premier League winning team? Um, it's hard to say. I mean, he's very green, isn't he? Um, very, very green. Um, but you know, with and with a as Levi touched on with a squad that's not the not one of their best squads. Squads, admittedly, yet. I'm sure Chelsea supporters would admit that they've done quite well, but is that is that the fact that everyone else around them uh, isn't really pulling up their socks at the moment? Um, you know, Spurs haven't had a good year, Arsenal haven't had a good year. Um, is that part of the reason why? Because I mean, you look at their their back four, and and like Levi said, they're not they're not a title winning they're not a title winning team. Um, their front their midfield is 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 really really good, um, but their back uh, their back line and their strikers with with um, um, his name's completely gone out of my head. Tammy, Tammy with Tammy. Um, you know, <laughs> that's that's not enough. Um, and they've done really well, so it's kind of hard to say. I think maybe another season, everyone's going to really try and you know get back into that top four. Now you've got Arsenal, you've got Spurs. There's other teams around like Wolves. Um, Liverpool and United and City will be there. United's always there. Let's have a look next season when he does have players um, that are considered world class players, um, and see how they and how we go from there. But I'm almost like I'm sitting on the fence here a bit, um, not like giving you an, a yes or a no answer. But I don't think I, for me, I don't think I, I can at the moment. I think it's too early. Yeah, yeah, it's difficult. I'd say Chelsea's back four isn't as isn't that good yet because they're, they're, they're a young back four, the likes of mm. Tamore and um, Rhys James uh, and they, they will mature as players and I think they'll just get better and better and go from strength to strength. So 
Um, I think in a couple of years, um, the young squad that they're building um, have a lot of bags and bags of potential. And I think if we give Frank Lampard a chance of being a young manager as well, I think I think he could he has the ability to do it. But if not, if we are looking at different managers, then um, um, why not look at the likes of um, Nuno Espirito Santo? Yeah. Santos, Great manager. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> you just said it right. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, I think he he'd be able to get the best out of um, his his team as well. And I think he's he's an interesting manager in the sense of um, before Wolves started doing really well, um, he was almost un- quite unknown. So mm-hmm. uh, I think it'd be quite good to see see him go to a, a big club and really achieve what he can possibly achieve. But yeah, um, Chelsea's team will just go from strength to strength. They keep signing the players that they're signing. Um, keeping them young, but also bringing through quite a lot of the academy because they've had to. Um, I think, yeah, the likes of uh, tomorrow might even be able to slip into the England setup as well. Yeah. What I will say is because Lampard is a legend at Chelsea um, and he's also, he's also um, coming at a really good time where to come behind City and Liverpool is is not going to be looked upon negatively. Mm-hmm. Um, so he will be allowed time. Um, I think maybe if this was uh, a different season and the landscape was different, then maybe um, people might, you know, say, oh, maybe it's too early for him, like in managers of the yeah. past that have, have done the same thing. So I think he's he is quite lucky that he's 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 in the time frame that he is in time, if that makes sense. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, right, we will uh, have to cut the show short there greg sorry you didn't get to speak too much on the on the football section um <laughs> how, how many games are spurs going to win in their final nine fucking none of them mate <laughs> <laughs> all right we'll, we'll leave on that note uh we've got to uh yeah we, we're gonna end uh btf uh, 46 here again um thank you john uh greg and levi um for uh, the conversation today. Uh, I think it's important and I hope um, that our viewers also uh, appreciate uh, the openness today. Uh, but yeah, so we'll be back next week for BTF 47. Um, look forward to it next Saturday, 11.30 p.m. Uh, we'll see you all yeah. there, boys. Have a good weekend. Cheers. Stay safe. You too, yeah. Dan. Stay safe. All right. Sit down. Yeah. Bye-bye, boys. Bye. Yep.